welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, hey, are you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord tonight? You know, I thought that that would be a little bit more. I know that tonight's a big night for, for the National Football League. So you are the committed ones. You are the ones that said, you know, it doesn't matter about football. I'm going to get to church. So I thought when I said that, that I would get more of a response. You know, because I was like, this is tonight. This is the committed group. Now, now a guest speaker, see, a pastor wouldn't say this, but a guest speaker might say that this is the saved group of, of, the, of the, no, but I know, I know, I know. So hey, are you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord tonight? That's what we're here for, amen? Well, I'll tell you what, we didn't come into this place to hear from a man. We didn't come into this place to hear from a woman. So I'm going to go ahead and get down on my knees as we go before the Lord in prayer. Would you join me in honoring and reverencing the Lord and stand if you're able to stand? So we go before the Lord in prayer tonight. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we're so grateful for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. To hear from your word, Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or from a woman. God, we don't come into this place to be entertained. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. And Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be in our midst, in our presence today, to speak to us, to reveal things to us. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear your word tonight as you would have us to hear, Father, that it would be a seed sown on good ground, Lord, that we would leave this place tonight impacted and prepared to do what you have called us to do in the ministry and the works of the ministry. God, we don't at any time see ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co-laborers in the kingdom of God. So, Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would impart the same blessing that we ask in this place among, amongst all the churches of the Inland Empire and all around the world, Father, that anybody who's teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, Father, I think that your presence would be with them as well, Lord. And we lift them up to you, our brothers and sisters. Father, we also lift up our senior pastors, Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah, to you in Australia. And we thank you that you would encourage them, strengthen them to, to sow into the lives of the pastors in Australia, Father, as we could be a global body of, of Jesus Christ. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for all that you are accomplishing in your body, us, your people. And we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. We all said, Amen. Amen. Well, as you're seated, why don't you open your Bibles to the book of Matthew. I'm excited about the word of the Lord tonight as I was studying in my Bible a few weeks ago. I was reading into Matthew. and We're going to look at a very familiar, very well-known verse, but I think that the Lord has got some amazing things. And even though there's familiarity there, it doesn't mean that we know everything about it. And I'll tell you what, God is good. And we're going to pick up in Matthew, the sixth chapter. In the tail end of Matthew, the sixth chapter, here Jesus Christ is... His teaching, this is his sermon that he begins. And you can see if you have your Bible, and your Bible is uh, words of Christ in red, you'll see that all of Matthew, the sixth chapter, is, is read because Jesus is delivering his sermon. And, and what, a, what a powerful sermon, what an what a expansive sermon it is. And so as I was studying, the word of the Lord just came alive to me as I was reading this. And I tell you, it just exploded off the page. And the title, of tonight, the title of tonight's message, if you're taking notes, is Need to know. If you've ever heard the term, you're on a need to know basis, and maybe you need to know, or maybe you don't need to know. Well, tonight we're going to look at a very familiar passage in, passage in Scripture, and I, I titled the, 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 the message tonight, Need to Know, because you and I, as we're going to see tonight through the Word of God, are on a need to know basis, and we very much need to know. What Jesus has to say about our lives, what Jesus has to say about our daily lives, about our finances, our families, our children's, whatever it might be, our issues, big or small. There's nothing too big for God. There's nothing too small for God. It's all expansive. It's all inclusive. And you and I are on a need-to-know basis. And so here Jesus Christ is delivering his sermon in Matthew, the sixth chapter. Let's pick up in... Verse number 31, we're going to read verse number 31 through there, verse number 34. Like I said, very familiar scriptures. And here Jesus is speaking and he's preaching. Matthew, the sixth chapter in the verse, 31st verse. And Jesus says, therefore, now we can't go very far if we see it therefore. Because Pastor Jim has taught us for so many years that when we see the word therefore, that we know that it's there for a reason. 
So without having to divulge the whole Matthew, the sixth chapter to you, Jesus Christ is talking about worry. He's talking about the issues that we deal with, the daily stresses of life. And he goes on to talk about the birds and the flowers and, and how God and Pastor Dan brought the, the, the message this weekend on the same subject about how God so takes care of the birds of the air and he, and he clothes the, the flowers of the field with splendor. And the Bible, Jesus says in his sermon that Solomon and all of his riches didn't compare to the flowers and, of the field. And he goes on to say, doesn't God who cares so much more about you therefore know what you need? So he says, having known all that, that God has your best interest in mind, Verse number 31, he says, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Now, interestingly enough, I think here that Jesus is speaking to the basic essentials of life, food, water, shelter or clothing, protection from the environment. But in today's day and age, those are issues or those are things that oftentimes in our life are battles. I don't know if any of you have ever been in this situation, but I was sharing with our young adults that whenever it comes time for my wife and I to pick where to eat, it's an argument. Because we can never agree. She wants a burrito, I want a hamburger, and I ask her, hey babe, what shall we eat? Well, I don't know, what do you want? 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 We go to the store, we go to the, the market, we go to the mall, what shall we wear? And so even though Jesus is speaking to our essentials, the essentials of life, food and water we have to have, shelter and clothing we have to have, he's also, I believe, knows the, the condition of mankind and knows that there are small things in life that oftentimes become large things in our perspective. And so Jesus says, hey, listen, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. Don't worry about the basics or the bare essentials. Don't worry about the petty things. Oh, you want a burrito, or you want this, or oh, you're going to make this much money, or oh, your job's going to go this way. He's speaking to the subject of worry, and it's fun that we sang that song. Don't worry, it's going to be all right. Because that's, this is the, the subject of this, this series and his message. And so he says in verse number 31, Don't worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? In verse number 32, for after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Now Matthew the 6th chapter and the 33rd verse comes along. And this is a familiar verse, I'll tell you for me. This is probably the first verse that I learned because my father, Pastor Jim, had a license plate on, on his car that had Matthew, M-A-T-T-6-3-3 was his license plate. And after he had sold the car, the license plate was right in the garage. Every time we pulled up, you'd see the blue California license plate with the yellow letters that said M-A-T-T-6-3-3. And so we always, as a kid, as, as children, we always learned that Matthew, the sixth chapter, the 33rd verse, was kind of the answer to all things Christianity. And the truth of the matter is it is. If, if you could sum it up, here it is. Jesus Christ says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All these things speaking of the things that he was just speaking about. The basics, the bare essentials, the necessities, your food, your water, your shelter. If God can take care of the flowers of the field, don't you know that God can take care of you? <laughs> Verse number 34, Jesus goes on to say, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, Hallelujah. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient is the day for its own trouble. Interestingly enough is here Jesus is delivering this sermon some 2,000 years ago. He didn't know the pressures and the stresses that you and I would deal with today. The, the text message and the instant communications that you deal with. The, 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 the instant information at your fingertips that you deal with, the stresses of knowing that if you've invested in the stock market, not having to have a good day at work and come home to find out that you've lost all your money, now you can find out right away that your money's gone. <laughs> and Jesus, interestingly enough, there were stresses 2,000 years ago as they walked and traveled from city to city. There were stresses Enough for the day to worry about itself. Don't you know that things haven't gotten much better in our world, right? That there is sufficient worry for today for us to not spend today worrying about tomorrow. Amen. 
So the title of tonight's message was Need to Know. And before we can dive into what we know and what we've read in Matthew, the sixth chapter, in the 33rd verse, I want to bring something to your attention. If you'll go back with me to Matthew, the sixth chapter, the 32nd verse, Jesus says this one more time For after all these things, food, water, shelter, basic necessities. Okay. For after all these things, verse number 32 says, the Gentiles seek. Now, I want to deliver, I want to show you some thoughts here. Some translations say the heathen think. The Gentiles, now let me tell you this, Jesus Christ, as he was delivering his sermon on the mount, was speaking to Jews. So he was traveling through, he was speaking to the Jews. And to a Jew, the word Gentile, that's a word that you'll see in the Bible. It's not a word that we use very often in today's lingo, in today's vernacular. But in, in Jesus' time, the word Gentile meant this very simple phrase, very simple meaning. Anybody who wasn't a Jew, that's it. Well, it's not very deep. If you were not a Jew, you're a Gentile. The word meant unclean, uninformed, uneducated. Here's the reason why is the Jews, through generation after generation from the exodus of Egypt, through the, the, the formation of the law, through the, through the conquests of King David and the, and the expansion of King Solomon, through the captivity, all through the prophets, to see the Jews had passed down information from one generation to the next about their God, about their laws. They begin to teach their kids right off the bat about the law, about the works of God, about the history of God, about where they came from, about how they were the chosen people. And so Jesus is saying, listen, don't worry about what you're eat, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, the basic, the bare necessities. Because after this, the Gentiles, the people who are not Jews, the people who had not been taught since they were born about the history of how God had delivered them, the people who had not been informed about the, 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 the God who had delivered them, about the people who had not been in the know-how, the people who had not been in the need to know. Don't be like them. Why? Because they are ignorant. Now, when we think of the word ignorance, we think of somebody who's thick-headed, somebody who's, who's, who's going their own way. But really, I was looking it up and I was thinking about this. The word ignorance, as defined in the dictionary, means simply this. If you are ignorant, you are simply lacking knowledge or awareness about something in particular. And in the case of the Gentiles, it was God. They didn't know about him. They had maybe read about him through, you know, the, the, the well-educated ones might have read, through, read about him through studying historical scriptures and reading about the accounts of Babylon and Assyria and things of that nature. But to the general populace, the people who were not Jews, they didn't know about God. And here Jesus makes an interesting statement in verse number 32. He says, don't worry about the basics. Don't worry about the, the, the necessities. Because that's what the people who don't know God worry about. Interesting. Interesting. So here I, I placed an emphasis. We can go and put it. Oh, he's got, they've already got it up. Is here I put the emphasis on this. I don't want to add to the Bible, so I wanted to make sure you knew. Jesus says in Matthew, the sixth chapter, in the verse 32, says, For after all these things, the Gentiles, the ignorant, seek. But your heavenly Father knows what you need. So here we're talking about need to know. And this is where I want to go with you tonight is that you and I need to know. If we want to live Matthew the 6th chapter and the 33rd verse, we'll get to that in a moment. There are some things that we have to know because Jesus made it a point to, to, to tell the people that if you don't know, if you are ignorant, lacking knowledge in certain things, that it will be very difficult for you to put your faith and trust in God. Because you don't know. Therefore, the title of tonight's message is, You Need to Know. I hope you guys kind of put that together with me. I thought a lot about that as I was putting this together. So if you've got a ribbon in your Bible, put your ribbon, keep your ribbon in Matthew the 6th chapter, because we're going to come back. I want to take a break before we jump. Before we make the jump to the 33rd verse, I want to take 
a, a little rabbit trail to show you some of the things that you need to know. Now, obviously, as we go here, there are so many things that you need to know that our time limits what I can tell you tonight. Now, we could sit here for weeks, months, years on end, going through the Word of God with a fine-tooth comb saying, Ha! Ah, I need to know that. Ha! Ah, I need to know that. Ha! Ah, I need to know that. Case in point, it's been several years since we've started the book of Hebrews on Sunday morning, and we're in the fourth chapter. So we, we've only got a short amount of time. We've got 20 minutes left. So there's a few things that I want to show you in the Word of God about things you need to know in order to apply Matthew, the 6th chapter, and the 33rd verse. So put a ribbon there. We're going to come back to Matthew, the 6th chapter, and turn with me in your word, in your Bible, to Ephesians in the 2nd chapter. To Ephesians in the 2nd chapter. We're talking about need to know. In Ephesians, the 2nd chapter, Paul the Apostle is writing to the church. Some think that this may not have necessarily been a direct letter to the church at Ephesus, but rather a letter that Paul had designed to be circulated around the churches because this particular book does not face uh, a certain and specific issues like most of the other books and other, most of the other letters to the churches do. But here Paul is writing to the church, and they, they, they credit this to the church at Ephesus. First and foremost, we're talking about need to know, why did I bring you to Ephesians? Because Jesus said, after all these things, the Gentiles seek, right? The heathen, those who don't know, those who are ignorant. Well, guess who populated the church at Ephesus? Can you guess? Anybody? Gentiles. This was a primarily a Gentile church. Now, it's it said that Ephesus at the, time of, at the time of the writings of these letters had some 250,000 people. It was a bustling port city. It was a, it was a place of commerce. And, and the church at large was, was Gentile, although, that there, although there were Jews in the church at the time. Paul is primarily writing to the Gentiles, to the uninformed, to the, what we could just say are to the ignorant, to the new Christian. And in the first verse, in the first chapter... He's giving an exhortation about their calling, about how God has chosen them. And now he begins to speak to them in the second chapter about things they need to know. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1. Paul the Apostle writing and he says, And you, speaking to the Gentile church, you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, and which... You once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, the, the general he's speaking to, the general spirit of darkness of Satan here, and he says, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh. Hold on right there. Desires of our flesh. Jesus Christ spoke about this in Matthew, the 6th chapter, in the 32nd verse. Of these things the Gentiles seek. So here again we see the parallel that the Gentiles seek. We who are ignorant or who were ignorant seek the desires of our flesh. I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where I have sought the desires of my flesh. Can anybody else amen me on that one? Oh, Hallelujah. And of the mind, we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others, Gentiles. Verse number four, but God, whoo, don't you know, he's changing the page. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace... You have been saved. Verse number 6 goes on to say, And has raised us up together, and has made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse number 7, That in ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Praise God, I'll tell you what. Here Paul the Apostle is writing to the Gentile church, the ignorant that you might say, because they didn't grow up knowing this. They came into this. They were grafted into this. They were adopted into this. And here Paul the Apostle says, you and I were once of the former. You and I were once ignorant, seeking our own desires, worrying about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, 
what we're going to wear, worrying about where our finances are going to come from, worrying about what tomorrow will hold, worrying about the little things, worrying about the great things, seeking after our own desires, living according to the world and the world's standards. But God comes and says, now all of a sudden there are some things that you need to know. There are some things that you need to realize because you are no longer who you once were. And so out of these scriptures, quickly before we go back into Matthew, the sixth chapter, I want to talk to you about things you need to know. You need to know. Number one, out of verse four, you need to know that God is a God of mercy and of love. God is a God of mercy and of love. When we want to put Seek first the kingdom of God, and we want to go before God. I don't know about you, but there are times when I feel like God just doesn't want to have any more of my drama. Like I've just messed up too many times. I'll tell you, as a, as a young adult's pastor, specifically dealing with young people, a question I get asked a lot of times is, Pastor Luke, what about the terrible things that I've done in my past? I'm here to tell you tonight that we serve a God of mercy and of love. Hallelujah. And that even though we were once dead in our trespasses and in our sin, sin separates us from God, causes us death. We were born into that. God is a God of mercy and of love. Verse number four says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Who is rich in mercy. We don't serve a God who is stingy in mercy. Well, you know, you, you just keep messing up. And I'm just, I'm getting really, my mercy is really running thin. We don't serve a God like that. We don't go before a God like that. We don't have a God who sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, like the word tells us in John the third chapter, who, who so loved the world that he died for us. But rather, we serve a God rich in mercy. So it doesn't matter, church, our past. It doesn't matter where we've come from. It doesn't matter what we did. You know, yesterday, I dented my car doing a stupid bonehead thing that tried to save myself 30 seconds in rushing, and I dented my car, put a nice whopper in the back of my car. And I'll tell you something. Pastor Luke said some high school words. <laughs> Thank God we serve a God rich in mercy and in love, that I could go before God and say, God, why do I say those things when I get mad? I don't know, but Lord, I don't want to say those things anymore. And to know that God says, although he may say, why do you say them? I don't know either, but I love you. I love you. I forgive you. And we can go before God. The Bible tells us we could go before God, confess our sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. Amen. You know, the word of God says, I'm just going to quote this for time. If you're taking notes, jot it down. Read it later. The Bible says in Psalms 106, verse number 1, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us that the, that the mercies of God are everlasting and renew every morning. Hallelujah. Thank God we don't serve a God that takes a tally of every time we say a bad word, takes a, takes a tally of every time we slip and, 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 and resort back to what we once were. Thank God we have a God of mercy and of love. And that's something that you and I have got to know, need to know that if we're going to go before God, if we're going to seek God first, we have got to understand that we can go before God with our head held high because we have a God of mercy and of love. Amen? Talking about things... You need to know. You need to know. I need to know. We need to know. Number two, out of verse number five at Ephesians, the second chapter, we have been made alive in Christ. We were once dead. We were once separated from God. All the way back to the Garden of, uh, of, of Eden and Adam and Eve when God told Adam and Eve that, hey, if you eat of the fruit of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's a mouthful. But he says, hey, if you eat of that, you will surely die. Sure enough, when they ate it, guess what? Adam and Eve didn't fall over dead. They stayed living. But spiritually, inside, they became disconnected to God. And you and I were born dead. Disconnected from God. Helpless about it. 
ignorant about it, heathen about it. But praise God, because we serve a God who is rich in mercy and love. He has made us alive. He has transformed us from death into life through Christ Jesus. Ephesians, the second chapter and the fifth verse says, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. God is good. Jesus Christ came and died and rose again. Likewise, you and I came and were born dead, but we have risen now. From death to life through Jesus Christ. No longer now are we who we once were. That old man has been crucified with Christ, the Bible tells us. And we have been made alive, now connected with God. So if we want to, verse 33, to seek first the kingdom of God, we have got to understand that you and I are now alive with Christ. In Christ Jesus by grace. 1 John, the 5th chapter and the 12th verse says this. Again, write this down. He who has the sun, capital S, not the sun in the sky, has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. You and I were once dead, but now we are alive and called for a purpose in God. Amen? Amen. We're talking quickly about some things we need to know. Things we have got to know out of Ephesians, the the, the second chapter, out of verse number six tonight, number three, that you have been lifted up. Yes, you have been made alive, but now the Bible tells us that we have been raised in Christ. We have been lifted up. We have been elevated to a new position. You know, here's the reason I want to say that. Because the Jews were the chosen people. Chosen by God. Promised by God. Deliver, promised to deliver. Jesus Christ came. He says, I came to seek and save the lost to the Jew first and then the Gentile. But now you and I, the heathens, the ignorant, the uninformed, the uneducated, we have now been lifted up and placed in a category of the others, placed from a category of people who were considered the others. Remember I said the definition of a Gentile was anybody who was not a Jew. So we were placed from a category of the outsiders to now the insiders. And we are insiders with Christ. We are insiders. We have been elevated to a position in God's eye where a sparkle in his eye comes upon us because, like Ephesians says, we are the chosen people in God. And Christ came and died for you and I. We sit here today no longer on the outside looking in, but rather now on the inside looking at God. And we have been lifted up. We have been elevated to a new position in Christ Jesus. Ephesians, the second chapter, verse number six says, and raised us together. Raised us together. Now here's an interesting tangent I want to show you. In Acts, the fourth chapter, Peter goes before the council of the, of the, Jew, of the Jews after, delivering a, or after uh, performing a miracle, a healing on a man who was in his, in, his age, in his 40s. And he was preaching the name of Jesus Christ in Acts, the fourth chapter, and they bring him before the council. And he speaks the name of Jesus Christ, and he says, I'm here to preach the name of Jesus, of Nazareth, whom you crucified. And they look at him. And here's Peter. I want to remind you that Peter was a fisherman. Peter was, was a, was a blue-collar man. Not a highly educated man. He didn't study under the, the Pharisees. He didn't study under the great rabbis. He learned his word as a kid. And then he went into the trade of his father. And so here's a blue collar man sitting before a bunch of equivalents to our days, PhDs. And he's making his case for Jesus Christ in Acts the fourth chapter. The 13th verse, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived, in other translations say, they recognized that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled and realized that they had been with Jesus. The rabbi of rabbis, the teacher of teachers, the, the, the example of God incarnate himself. And they say, hey, listen, all of a sudden there's these blue-collar men who were capable of only this.
But yet, because they have been with Jesus, they have been elevated to a place that the PhDs, that the religious leaders of their time, the educated, the well-informed, marveled and went, oh, these guys are amazing. To the point where they said, we can't find conviction in them. We can't find fault in them. So what we'll do is we'll just threaten them that if you keep doing this, we'll hurt you. But we can't do anything today about it. They marveled at a bunch of blue collars. Church, it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what your parents did. It doesn't matter if your hands are dirty at the end of the day and there's dirt under your fingernails at the end of the day or if you sit behind a desk with a PhD. It doesn't matter where you came from because when you came into the family of God, you were lifted up, you were elevated to a new place and now the potential is with God, not with your education or where you came from. Things that we have got to know, if we're going to seek first the kingdom of God, we got to know that we aren't who we once were. We're not bound by our parents. We're not bound by what the, what the society says we are. We're not bound by our checkbooks. We're not bound by what our car gas mileage says. Because God is a God greater than all that thing. Amen? We're talking about things we need to know. Last one. And then we'll come back into Matthew. Last one you need to know. Number four out of verse number six again. You have a future with Christ. We have a future with Christ. This is important. Because let me tell you something. Your circumstance may say you don't have a future. Your issue that you might be worrying about. What tomorrow may bring may look like your future's at an end. But through Christ Jesus, you have a future better than today. Here's the thought. You may be going through a great time right now. You might be making all sorts of money. In this down economy, you might have started a business when everybody else was losing it, and you might be successful. Let me tell you something. Even in that moment, you have a future in Christ better than today. But even if you're on the darkest of dark, in the, in the valley of the shadow of death, and you're passing through it, passing through it, you have a future with Christ better than today. With Christ, we have a future. Back to verse number six. Paul says, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You and I have a future to sit with Jesus. To sit at the foot of the throne of God Almighty and praise Him and worship Him in paradise. Amen. We have a future. In Luke, the 23rd chapter, for time's sake, again, write this down. Let me read it to you. Luke, the 23rd chapter. Here's two, two criminals hung on the cross, one on each side of Jesus, talking about you think that your future, you think that your consequences of your life lead to one direction. Here are two criminals on the side of Jesus Christ as he's being crucified. One mocks him and one says to the other, don't you know who you're talking to? This is Jesus Christ. Give him some respect. Then he looks over to Jesus Christ and he says, he says, well, he says to his companion, well, you and I have deserved our punishment. This man is innocent. Then he looks to Jesus Christ and he simply asks him, remember me. Jesus, remember me. And here, our future in Jesus Christ, here to a thief that has been sentenced justly to death according to the laws of his land. Jesus says to him in Luke, the 23rd chapter, in the 41st verse, the criminal says, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. If we live according to this land, the laws of our land, we get what we deserve. But according to Jesus Christ, this man has done nothing wrong. And Jesus said to him, and then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. We were destined for death but Jesus took us out of the muck and the mire and out of the, 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 the dismal life that we live. And he said, listen to me today. You will be with me in paradise. You have a future in Christ Jesus. Doesn't matter what your circumstance is. 
Now, if you want to seek first the kingdom of God, that should be the goal to understand that even though your situation may be dire at the moment, even though your kids may be turning away from God or your kids may be doing this or that, your finances may be falling apart, your marriage may be going through issues, to understand this, that you have a future with Christ Jesus. And when you have that in mind, you have got now what we like to say is the big picture. You have a big picture picture mentality and now all of a sudden you know and you are no longer the ignorant you are no longer the uneducated but now you are the in the know you're on a need to know basis and now you need to know so with the bigger picture in mind I told you to put a ribbon in your Bible let's go back to Matthew let's go back to Matthew as we conclude Matthew, the sixth chapter. Jesus Christ, in verse number 31 through 32, says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles, the ignorant, some translations say the heathen, seek after. Things you need to know, for your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. You need to know that God knows your needs. You need to know that God has got your back. You need to know that God understands where you've been. Pastor Dan's message this weekend. That we have a high priest who can sympathize with us. For you, for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. Verse number 33. But, first off, I I can't go any further before I say this, but... You know, I looked up the word but in the dictionary because I like to look up words in the dictionary. It always intrigues me. You know what but means? I mean, we always use it. Do we actually know what it means? It means but. (laughs) But is used to introduce something contrasting with what's already been mentioned. another, Another way to say but is except for the fact. So here Jesus Christ says, after all these things the Gentiles seek, except for the fact that you seek first the kingdom of God. A faith statement to you and I. The Gentiles, the heathen, the ignorant, they worry about life. But on the contrary, you and I don't have to worry about that because there are things that we know. We know that God is on our side. We know that God knows our needs. We know that God is a God who's rich in mercy. We know that God loves us. And now because we know that you and I can seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow... Is will worry about its own things. Sufficient is the day, for the day is its own trouble. We don't have to worry, church. We don't have to stress. Now, do we? Of course. We're people. We're human. Hello. But the bottom line is, is that you and I don't have to live a life swamped by worry, by anxiety, by fear, but rather by faith. Therefore, verse number 34, again we see that therefore, therefore means it's there for a reason because of what I've just said. Know that God takes care of you, Jesus says. The more you experience God, the less you tend to worry. Why is that? Because you know. Because you know. You know that God is a God of mercy and love, that his mercies never fail. Because you know that we have been made alive in Christ who were once dead, but now we are alive, life more abundantly, Jesus Christ says that he came to bring us. Because you know that we have been lifted up. No longer are we who we once were, but now we are who God says we are. You know that you have a future in Christ, that although you might be in the valley of the shadow of death, or it may seem like you're in the valley of the shadow of death, you know that you have a future in Christ Jesus. And the more you know, the more you know that you need to know. Come on. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Pastor Luke, Pastor Luke, I, I, you, you went over my head on that one. 
The more you know about God, the more you realize that you need to know more about God. I've gone late, but there's one thing I want to share. One more verse. Can, can we go through one verse? One more verse. Can we do that? I know I've been late, but hey, it's the word. Turn with me in your Bibles really quickly. We'll conclude on this. This final thought for tonight, talking about going before the Lord, seeking first. First Peter, the fifth chapter. If you've got your Bible, turn with me to First Peter, the fifth chapter. First Peter, the fifth chapter. I always share this with people because this is a thought. As in my studies that came to. First Peter, the fifth chapter. Verse number seven. We quote this a lot to each other. First Peter 5, 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Yep. You know what's funny, though? The Bible wasn't written in verse and chapter. The Bible was written as a letter. The New Testament. And if you read chapter 5, verse number 7, you'll find that that C is a lowercase because it's in the middle of a sentence. And as Christians, we tend to go to, oh, you're going through a problem? Oh, man, your kids are just, uh, they're, give, they're making your hair turn gray. Hey, brother, cast all your care on him. Cast your care on him. Cast your cares, brother. You know, as a human, I don't know if you've ever tried to just kind of take your care and pull it out from somewhere and kind of... <laughs> Cast it on God. If you could do that, guess what happens? Your cares have a way of finding their way back to you. Amen? We cast our care. Oh, God, I give you my cares. 30 seconds later, what am I going to do? God, I give you my cares. What am I going to do? God, I'm going to give you my cares. Because remember Matthew 6, said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. 1 Peter 5, 7. It's midway thought. It was a mid-thought through a sentence. Let's look at verse number six. Therefore, therefore a reason. Man, there's so many therefores in the Bible. The more you know about God, the more you know you need to know. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Do you know what the act of humbling yourself before God is? Matthew, the 6th chapter, the 33rd verse. Seeking first the kingdom of God. When you humble yourself to something, what you're doing is you're allowing God to come and take precedence over your priorities, to take control over your life. Now all of a sudden you're not seeking your own answer, you're not seeking your own conclusion, you're seeking God who then therefore will exalt you and when you allow God to now be the leader of your life, God has you in his arms and you say, Hey, God, I've got problems somewhere, but I know that I'm in your arms. But when we seek our own priority and then we tell each other, Hey, brother, cast your cares. We miss it. We miss it. Because Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 33, sums it all up. We have got to... Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You want to be a businessman? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You want to be a good father? You want to be a good mother, a husband, a wife? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You want to be a good employee? You want to make a manager someday? You want to make lots of money? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You want your kids to grow up healthy and strong? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those other things that the ignorant worry about, you don't have to. Why? Because you know. Because you know. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? Hallelujah. And here's what I want to ask you. I want to ask you if you were to leave this place today and heaven forbid you were to die, your heart stopped beating, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question, but why don't we examine your answers? You know, the Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time, so let's go over some of those thoughts that you might have had. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I, I think I'm going to get to heaven. I sure hope so. I want to get to heaven. 
Did you know nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you can think, hope, or want to get your way into heaven, that God's going to look on you and say, okay, you thought about it, I think I can, I think I can. I'll get you into heaven. You wanted it bad enough, I'll get you there. Did you know that you can't get to heaven because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, or as a Muslim? So that means that you, by default, get into heaven? Do you know you can't get that nowhere in the Word of God? Do you see that? You know, you can't get into heaven because your parents told you you were a Christian as a child. Maybe you attended religious classes, Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes. You know that's not going to get you into heaven? Do you know that because you know that you're not going to get into heaven because somebody told you you were a Christian because you were baptized or christened, because you attended church on Christmas and on Easter, because you're sitting in a service tonight? Did you know that you're not going to get your way into heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that because you sit in a service, because your parents told you you were a Christian, because you were baptized or christened. Nowhere will you find that you'll get into heaven in the Word of God. Did you know that you can't get into heaven by your good deeds? That because you're a good person, because you give to charitable organizations like the Red Cross, the Haiti relief effort, AIDS in Africa, whatever it might be, that because you've never robbed the 7-Eleven, because you've done more good in your life than bad, did you know that's not good enough to get you into heaven? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that according to God, our good works are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Yet, so many of us have believed that all we have to do is be good and we'll get into heaven like a little fairy tale thing our parents tell us so that we'd be good as kids. The truth of the matter is that nowhere in the Word of God will you find that. You know, so you ask the question, well, Pastor Luke, then how do I get into heaven? What, what must I do to get into heaven? You know, Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father except through him. So you know, you don't get to heaven your way. You don't get to heaven even my way. Or some well-meaning church committee's way. You get to heaven God's way. And God's way only. And that's through Jesus Christ. He said he is the way, the truth, and the life. As a matter of fact, a man by the name of Nicodemus in the book of John in the third chapter comes to Jesus at night and asks Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? And based on Nicodemus' life, based on his education, you would think that Jesus would pat him on the back, tell him, Nicodemus, man, great is your reward in heaven. You just keep on going. Because Nicodemus had dedicated his life to memorizing the word, to studying the word. Nicodemus could sing the scripture. He gave to the poor. He, he said all the right things. He wore all the right clothes. He taught in the, the temple the word of God. And you would think that somebody like that, Jesus would say, hey, man, Great is your reward in heaven. But he says to Nicodemus, you know, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, you've heard that term. Hollywood popular culture. Society's made a mockery out of that. You think of radical, crazy, out of control Christianity. Weirdo. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God's intent on born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. You see, Jesus Christ said he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through him. But God's after an all-or-nothing relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. In the book of the Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church, people like you and I sitting in a service, doing good things, hearing the word of God, speaking to the church, and Jesus Christ says to the church, when I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Whoa, shocking statement designed to get your attention. And what Jesus Christ is saying is when it comes time for you to meet him face to face, he better find you hot or cold because if he finds you lukewarm, you are deceived in thinking you're going to get your, yourself into heaven. He will vomit you out. One translation means that he will cast you out as worthless from the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me define that in terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Lukewarm means this. In terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ, lukewarm means that you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out. You're floating around, doing a little bit of your own thing, doing a little bit of God's thing. You're riding the fence right down the middle. You got enough of God in you to where you can't enjoy the things of the world, and you've got too much of the world in you to where you can't enjoy the things of God. You're riding the fence, and Jesus Christ says, hey, if that's you, you are deceived in thinking that you're gonna get your way into heaven. You see, God's not after your mental ascent towards him. He's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. You say, well, Pastor Luke, how do I get into heaven? Well, 
Let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way. Let's not try to get into heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. Let's get into heaven God's way. And you know what Jesus Christ said? He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three in a moment. And on the count of three, I'm going to smack my hand on the Bible. I'm going to go one, two, three, just like that. Smack my hand on the Bible. And if you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ in a moment, I'm going to ask you to be bold and pop your hand up. What you're doing by raising your hand in a moment, we'll all do it together. What you're doing by putting your hand up is you're saying, you know what, Pastor Luke, I acknowledge that I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart, all of my life. I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ, and I want to make sure that I get into heaven today. You say, Pastor Luke, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I put my hand up, I'm going to be embarrassed. You know, you might be embarrassed because you put your hand up. The person that you came with might see you. But let me tell you something. I'm not going to embarrass you. And even if you were embarrassed because you put your hand up, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't accept Jesus Christ in a welcome and warm and loving place like the church? You see, God has already done everything. He's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in or make his way in. God's already done everything he can in his power to make sure that you get into heaven by sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody, naked mess, hung a spectacle on the cross for all to see so that you could confess Jesus and give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. You see, God already gave you his everything, and now he wants your everything. The decision's yours. God's not going to make you. You can't raise the hand of the person next to you. It's between you and God. Whether or not you're going to get yourself into heaven. So who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ in a moment, if that's you, get your hand up. When I count to three. If you're not sure, you say, man, maybe I did this as a child, but I don't know. Maybe you've never, never made a public profession of your faith for Jesus Christ. In a moment, get your hand up when I count to three. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right down. And finally, who should get their hand up tonight? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, not wholehearted for God, not wholehearted against God, you've been riding the fence. Tonight, let's make it the night that you go hot for Jesus Christ and make sure you get your place into heaven. Get your hand up and I'll, I'll acknowledge it, I'll count it, you can put it right back down. And we'll go on from there. All across this auditorium, hands are getting ready to go up. If you're not sure today, make sure that's a gamble on your eternal life you cannot afford to make. Walk out of these doors without making sure. Make sure tonight if that's you in this place. The Bible says that our life is but a vapor. So all across this auditorium, if you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus, in a moment, get your hand up. If you're not sure, make sure today. If you've been living Luke warm, running from God instead of to God, when I, get, when I count to three, I smack my hand on this Bible. If that's you, get your hand up so I can see it. All across this auditorium, all at the same time. Here we go. On the count of three, if that's you, get ready. One, two, three. Three. Let me see your hands in the house tonight. One, two, three, four, five, six. I got you guys. Six people. Seven. I got you, brother. Eight. I got you, brother. If I saw you, you could put your hand down. Eight wise people. Where are you at? You say, I want to give them all of my heart. I want to give them all my life. If that's you in the house, get your hand up so I can see it. In the family rooms, is there anybody in the family rooms? Get your hands up if I can see, so I can see them. Anybody in the house tonight? Eight wise people. You say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Get your hand up tonight so I can see it. You can put it right back down. Eight wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you if that's you in this house tonight. Come on. Stop playing games with God. Quit messing around with God. And let's make tonight the night you go hot for God. If that's you in this place, get your hand up so I can see it. I know there's more than eight of you by the Spirit of God. If that's you. Nine. I got you, brother. Where are you at? Number ten saying, man, I wonder if I should. Man, I wonder if I should. Ten, I got you in the family room. Saying, I wonder if I should. Saying, I wish this guy'd shut up. I want to get out of here. Get your hand up so I can see it. I won't be mad. That's you in this place. Ten wise people. Anybody, in the house, anybody else in the house tonight? Anybody else? Ten wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. If that's you in this place, get your hand up so I can see it. I'm going to close it up right now. Anybody else? Well, praise God for 10 wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. For the 10 of you that raised your hand, 
For those of you who didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. I'm going to ask you in a moment to be bold. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. And if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to be bold. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your Bible, a friend, if you need a friend, your purse, whatever you brought with you, get out of your seat, get out of your, child, uh, out of your chair, from the family rooms, wherever you're at, come on, and get out of your seat, get out of your chair. You said you want to give Jesus Christ all of your heart, all of your life as we stand. Come on, get out of your chair, get out of your seat. Come up here today. Let us pray with you today. Let us help you. That's you. Come on, get out of your seat, get out of your chair. You can come from the family rooms, wherever you're at. You're not too old, you're not too young. You come, come on. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Come on down. Come home to Jesus. Come home to Jesus. Come on. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out. Come on. Come on down. Come on down. Your love never fails, never gives up. Keep coming. Come on. Welcome in this place. You're welcome in this place. They're coming. They're coming down. We'll wait for you. You come. They're coming. They're still coming. We'll wait. Hey guys, listen, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Today is a new day. You know, you don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to come into your life. So what we're going to do, I'm going to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here? This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is like the nicest guy you'll ever meet. It's almost kind of sickening how nice he is, really. He's so nice. What Pastor Dave's going to do, he's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on, I promise. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You're going to accept Jesus Christ, ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, come into your life to be the Savior of your life. He's going to give you some free things, a book that our senior pastor wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny. Very easy reading. He says, hey, I just got saved. Now what do I do? Very easy reading. And he's going to do one more thing. He's going to invite you into a program that we have here at the church called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you see a personal trainer. Somebody helps you, comes alongside you and helps you build those weights, make sure you get strong. A spiritual personal trainer is a friend, somebody that will meet with you before service for 10, 15 minutes, teach you some things about God for five weeks to get you strong in the ways of the Lord so that you don't go back to what you came from and that you go ahead with your life with Jesus Christ. That's a five-week program, and I want to ask one thing of you. That's five weeks. I want to ask for you to commit 12 months, one year, to sitting under the Word of God and listening and hearing the Word of God and get it into your life to know, to know. And I promise you that you'll look back on this day, one year from now, and say, wow, I never knew my life could be so rich in God. I promise you, I guarantee you, if you commit 12 months, you will see God do something amazing in your life. So if you guys would just go right over there with Pastor Dave.